Oh, what's going on, y'all? Dwayne Dixon with Success of a Nation. It's good to be back. I ended the year on a bit of a downside. I messed around and caught COVID at the uh, holidays around Christmas, so that wasn't any fun. But um, enough about me. Today's episode, we start in 2022 off with a bang, y'all. His name is Rasul Mudawakil, and um, he is a multifamily commercial real estate investor, and uh, it's so good to have him on. He's done so many things in such a short period of time, going from zero to a hundred million in 14 months so with that alone um, I had to have him on and above all of that he's a great person so um, I'm gonna fade out and fade into our interview and um, I appreciate you being here without further ado we're gonna get started with my interview with Rasul Take care. How's it going, guys? This is Dwayne Dixon with Success of a Nation. And I've got Razul Mudawakil on today. He's a superstar in the um, multifamily space. Uh, he's, he's done so many things in such a short period of time. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you on, Razul. Um, I guess we'll get started by just letting everyone know, you know, a little bit about yourself and and then we'll just transition into uh and into how you got to where you are today. So we can um we can go from there. Absolutely, man. Thanks so much for uh, having me on your show, man. I really appreciate it. Um you know, I guess honestly if I'm if I if I think about it, I didn't just you know, I did all of this in a short time, but it didn't just start from when I started first got involved in a commercial multifamily. You know, okay. from a young age, man, my dad was an entrepreneur, right? And he's always been into like mindset development and positive thinking. And if I say something that is like not, you know, building myself up, or if I try to bring myself down, low self esteem, he would like, you know, snap that right out of me. Like, no, that's not how we talk, right? So from an early age, I have I've always had like a good foundation. Which I think, honestly, in any business endeavor is like the hardest part is getting your mind right. Absolutely. Uh, the mindset is, is much more important than people give it credit for. Uh, so my whole life, I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I got caught up. Man, I, I tried some things. I failed. And I was just you know, working really, really hard in something that I didn't love or I didn't care about. I was just trying to chase money. And so after defeat came, I was like, you know what? I don't want it bad enough. Let me go into the whole nine to five type deal. So I started off in IT. I built myself up into um, you know federal workforce uh, as um, an account executive for multifamily um, with HUD, and then I eventually became a senior financial analyst. And at, at that point, I figured I, you know, I made it right, six figure job, you right. know, living life comfortably. And I'm sitting there, you know, working numbers. I'm doing the math. I'm like. Man, I gotta I gotta do this for 30 more years and then retire. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I'm sure a lot of people are, are sitting there thinking about this, or maybe they're not even thinking about it. They're just thinking, hey, I'm making high income. This is how you know how you make it in this world. But for me, I knew that there was something bigger and better that I had to do. And so my wife and I uh, got out on the search for figuring out how to how to become a millionaire. Right. Okay. With our 401ks and our TSPs and our IRAs, I was like, we would get there eventually, but it would probably take, you know, 12 years before I even crack that. Right. Um, and being on the path that we were on, putting money away. Uh, so the first thing we found was, hey, most millionaires are made in real estate. I was like, OK, cool. Let's look up real estate. And then I learned about house hacking and my wife was down for buying a duplex down here in Miami where we live. We lived in one side, rented the other side out, right? I know a lot of people want to learn about the commercial multifamily and the apartment buildings, all those, you know, multiple hundred uh, unit buildings and stuff like that. The sexy part, right. 
Yeah, the sexy part, but you got to know about the boring small steps that you take in the beginning before you get there. Absolutely. So we were, we were doing the duplex, the house hacking, it was paying for itself. And then I was like, you know, if we move out, man, I think this thing pulls in enough money where we can probably have it pay for another house. So we started doing Airbnb and that was just a crazy cash infusion at that point. So, right. um, you know, that was going really well. The Airbnb was doing so great that it was paying for a duplex and it was paying for the house that we bought. Wow. And so I'm just like on cloud nine. I had to do a lot of work with that. Now I was my own property manager. Right? Yeah, Air- Airbnb then, is, is a nightmare or can be. It can From be. What I understand it, it, it wasn't the best for you. Well, it was, it was, it was a blessing and a curse, right? Okay. Because I was making it basically, it felt like we had a third person on our marriage contributing to our finances. But at the same time, it felt like I had a baby that I had to go take care of every few days. I had to be down there making sure the tenants were checking in, right? And everything like that. I didn't, I didn't think about property management or leveraging my time, right? Let me make a little bit less by paying somebody else to go take care of the headaches that I didn't want. Yeah. Um, so things were going pretty well until COVID happened, 2020, right? And right around that same time, right, all the travel stopped. So Airbnb bookings weren't going anymore. Um, and a friend of mine had reached out to me. Marvin Mitchell said, hey, uh, have you ever heard of a guy named Rod Cleef? I was like, as a matter of fact, I have, you know, my journey learning about multifamily. I saw a couple of stuff that he does apartment buildings, but I didn't, I never thought that I would, you know, get into that realm. I thought that was like, oh, when I make it, I'll get there, right? Um, he said, well, he's having a boot camp. I think it'd be good for you. And uh, it's going to take me from millionaire to multi, multi-millionaire. And so one of, my, one, of, one of my wealthy friends tells me, you know, gives me a hint. Gives me yeah. a hint, right? I'm going right. to go ahead and take it. So I, I took that boot camp and it just really opened my mind into how you can do things um, on a large scale with not necessarily having, you know, the whole, your own personal millions of dollars to go buy these buildings. Right. So I, I went to that boot camp and then I joined the mastermind myself, right? Signed up, drank the Kool-Aid. I was in both feet. Try to talk my wife into it because we've never done anything like that. no mentorship course where, you know, especially, you know, a high ticket course or anything like that. Right. So after we did that, um, I wanted to learn how to how these deals work. So the best way to, to learn about it is to be in it. I'm a, I learned by doing things. So right. I invested, you know, I put my money where my mouth was. I put my money into a, a 506B syndication. I invested and I sat in on those property management calls every single week, every Friday, 10 a.m., with Lee Fjord, Marvin Mitchell, uh, Chris Nantisa, all those guys. And I saw how they were handling the problems of the property, how they were turning it around from a troubled property into a, a more cash flowing property and increasing the value. And right. I was like, okay, this isn't rocket science. I've done rocket science, man. I, I have a degree in video game programming. I don't know if I told you that. Yeah, well, I, but, I, uh, I know a little something about your background just knowing you, yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, yeah, I was like, this is pretty straightforward. I really think I could do this. So then I saw it out I started networking. Right. And my strength is, uh, being very analytical. I learned how to underwrite deals, how to do the math behind these. And I can look at an apartment building and say, yes, this is a deal. No, this one is a dud. A lot of times people are just buying stuff left and right. And this market is kind of dangerous because you don't know how long this, this, uh, market is going to be on fire. Right. As soon as that fire goes out, you better make sure you have enough buffers in place to, to protect you on the downside. So with that, a lot of investors ended up trusting me with their money. And so when you have the money, all you got to do is find the right deal. So I was networking with a lot of people. I say, hey, who's got a deal? Who needs money? Right. I looked at the deal, analyzed it. And I say, hey, man, this 42 unit right here is really, really nice. And this one was in Cleveland Heights in Ohio. Brought some guys on, man. A uh, buddy of mine, uh, Dewey Wynn, um, brought a couple of his buddies that wanted to invest into a deal. And I said, hey. Let's go ahead. I'll do the presentation. I'll explain the investment opportunity. Everybody was on board. So I raised like a million dollars for my first deal, never having raised capital before, but just being able to speak confidently about the, about the opportunity. So okay. I raised a million bucks in about a week. Right. Wow. And yeah, um, yeah it, it went really smoothly. And then they have this thing in, in the commercial space called the law of the first deal. Right. It's really hard to get that first deal. I've been plugging away going like, I don't know, man. 6 a.m. to like 11 o'clock at night, every night, meetings, weekends, Saturday, Sunday, all that stuff, just hustling. So I'm like, and this is on top of my nine to five, right? I got my W-2. So all my, all my commercial stuff happened after I got off of work. Yeah. So um, I was doing that. And that's another thing, right? Not, not the sexy part of, of doing the business and entrepreneurialism is putting in your hours, putting in your yeah. time. 
Um, but I got that first deal. We took it to close. And um, sure enough, man, these guys that I did my first deal with, uh, Michael and Tal, they had another 48-unit JV opportunity. Boom. Put money in that one, right? Brought some other people. Bring some capital to that deal. And so I found myself being more of an underwriter and a capital raiser on these deals, right? Because people don't just want to put their money. Like putting your money into an investment is good and fun when you first get started. But if it doesn't produce on the back end, right, that's what that's what I do is ensure that, hey, no matter what, if this happens, if that happens, if this happens, your money's still going to be safe, still going to be cash flowing, and there's still going to be some appreciation on the back end. Now, it makes it really hard for me to find a good deal because everything is overpriced right now. But I still take the time and people are patient and they understand, like, look, we're not going to rush into a bad deal. If I really wanted to, I can go put a whole bunch of money into all these bad deals that are out there right now, but I'm not interested in doing that, right? Because, you know, my word is my bond, my reputation, all that other stuff. Right. So that's my second deal, a 48 unit JV from a networking event that I went to online, virtually. By the way, all this is done on Facebook, right? Uh, I haven't even been going. So you never virtually. went to Ohio? Never been to Ohio, not even, it's, we're coming up on a year and I get the updates, the reports, already getting distributions for all my investors, right? Everything is on track, everything looks good. Um, so the bank account speaking, that's what's up. Uh, I haven't had to be there in person just yet. I've got people who are in Ohio that I trust, that I work with, yeah. um, that are taking care of things over there. And um, so this other uh, young lady brought me an 18 unit deal. She said, hey, I, I'd love to have some help raising some capital. And I looked at the deal. I said, like, man, I really like these numbers. Told another buddy of mine. And then, we, and then um, you know, we got the money for that one. That was an 18 unit. There was four down units. All we have to do, bring those four units online, increase the NOI by 30%, right? Wow. In a commercial multifamily, if you guys aren't aware, it's valued different from uh, residential. Residential. Right? Because when you can do all the improvements in the world, you can add a pool, you can add a second floor to it if you really wanted to. But at the end of the day, that property is only going to sell for what the other properties are selling around it in the media vicinity. But in the commercial space, everything is valued based on the income, the NOI, net operating income, right? Before you uh, pay your mortgage. And once you increase the, if you increase the NOI by just $1, the value of that property at a six cap basically goes up somewhere between uh, 17 to $20. So you're getting 20 to one on your money for increasing the NOI. And right. I'm increasing the NOI on the property by 30%. So we're going to more than double the value of that property by the time we're done with it in a few months here. Which translates into hundreds of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands on an 18-unit property, right? You don't and you don't always necessarily have to be taking down these large 100, 300, 400-unit buildings to right. get a good deal, right? Because it's all about scale. Um, after that, I went to a networking event in person locally here in Miami. And the guy sat at my table we were just, you know, one of the instructions say, Hey, you know, tell everybody what you got, tell them what you need. And one of the guys says, Hey man, I've got a 506 B syndication. I can't advertise it. And my net worth, uh, my network, because they say your network is your net worth, right? His network was only good for about $7 million and he needed nine. I was like, well, all right, I'll get you the other uh, missing part. And um, we basically split that in the remaining two, many, uh, 2 million with a couple other uh, capital raisers. And so that, boom, just like that, I met a guy, had a conversation, looked at the deal. I really liked it. Uh, we had a meeting about that this morning, that same deal. We had a lease trade out. The last tenant that left was paying $1,000 a month right. for a two-bedroom. And the new tenant that just moved in was paying $1,500. Ooh, that's sweet. That How many unit, doors? How many uh, doors? 166 units in Bradenton, Florida. That's crazy, right? man. Over on the that's Gulf crazy. Side. Well, Razul, let me interrupt for a moment, man, because you've yeah. been breezing over a lot of stuff because, you know, <laughs> at this point, everything is like, you know, second nature to you. Right. But I want to talk about a couple of things. Number one, first of all, I just want to, you know, um, let you know the, the audience that we're usually that we're speaking to now as opposed to who we normally speak to. if. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're, you know, mentioning all of the, the NOIs and, yeah. it, it, you know, and the cash on cash returns, and they're not going to know about that. So what I'd ultimately like to do is the whole purpose of my show is to demystify the process. Uh, you know, okay. um, I know I got you on here. I know you're a superstar. You, you, your background is crazy because you knew how to crunch those numbers coming in 
Yeah. And that's real underwriting is just so key. Yeah. You know, but Very um, key. so I wanted to start and preface it by saying that so then you know we could kind of cater it to that. But I'd also like to ask just from the top, you 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 mentioning these millions like it ain't nothing. Well, you know, we we, we needed three million and we went and got three million. It's not yeah. necessarily like that for everybody. Can you no. speak to that? I know you're the consummate networker. You're yep. always up in somebody's picture with the smile. <laughs> and, then, you know, he, he's Mr. Congeniality through and through. But speak to that, man, because um, I think that's key. And um, if you could elaborate. We'll do, for sure. And um, I, this goes back to the, the very beginning of what I said. Right. Early on, my father instilled in me a really strong mindset of positive thinking and everything like that. And ultimately, what it comes down to is if you change your mindset, you'll change your actions. You change your actions, you'll change your habit. Right. You change your habit, you change the person that you're eventually going to become. A lot of us, uh, me included for a time. Right. Even if even though I had that entrepreneurial spirit that got beat down early on because I didn't understand about working within something that just means something to you, right? If you don't have that passion for whatever it is that you're going to try to apply yourself to, if you're just chasing money, a lot of times it's not enough, Yeah. right? Because when you work into something that you're passionate about, you will ultimately, when times get hard, the work still feels like play. You enjoy it, right? You enjoy, you know, right. the, the different aspects of it and everything like that. But if you're somebody who's, who's, you know, working a nine to five, maybe a couple of nine to fives, trying to make ends meet, right? Um, one of the things that I am a big proponent of is, um, is financial literacy, right? That's really ultimately what my big goal is, is being able to spread to the average person, hey, this is how money really works. This is what it is. It's yeah. a tool. And a lot of us, especially in America, are conditioned to become consumers. That's our mindset. Hey, we that's get that it. tax return. That's man, it. That's, that's new J's. That's a down payment on a car. Right. That's, you know, going out money, club, popping a bottle. I'm yep. guilty. I spent $700 on a bottle of Great Goose before the club in my 20s because I didn't know any better about what I was doing. I, I saw it on the music videos. That's the cool thing to do, right? <laughs> and I think back to myself. I'm like, wow. Hey, Jeezy did it. You <laughs> <laughs> right? And so it's like, you know, until you until you ask yourself these questions, like, why am I doing what I'm doing? Like, why are you the person that you are? Why do you think the things that you think? Right. A lot of us don't really take the time to figure out who we are as a person and what it is. Like, how are we influencing here? If you take that time to spend with yourself. Right. A lot of times in the mornings um, before I had my second kid, um, I was meditating in the morning, exercising doing all this like self-reflection and me time and stuff like that, trying to quiet all the outside noise because everything is trying to push and pull and get your attention. And it's important once you have the ability to tune out all that noise, change and control what it is that goes into your mind, reading positive books. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was younger. Um, yeah. uh, cash flow Quadrant, right? Understanding how to move from an employee to a self-employed individual from a self-employed individual to a business owner, from a business owner and not to an investor, which is where I'd like to consider myself. I'm between that B and I mode right now because I'm not just purely living off my investments yet, but uh, definitely from the business owner standpoint, I'm looking at things like, if I'm gonna spend this amount of money, what's my return on investment going to be? And how do I maximize that return, right? So I think if, if that's where the audience is, then that's probably the most important thing that they should take away from what I'm saying is you got to be able to figure out your mindset. I went in, I went into this with the mindset of, Hey, I'm going to set these goals. I initially only wanted to buy 200 apartment units. I had never done Mike. I had two, I had a, a duplex, one building with two doors. And right. so I'm like, you know what? Let me hundred X that. That was yeah. me stretching going beyond. I wanted to have $10 million in real estate under management and I wanted to have 200 doors. The old me who was working my nine to five afterwards, I would go to the gym at like, you know, five, six o'clock, get home at seven o'clock, eat dinner, watch some TV from eight to, to nine, 10 o'clock, 
and then play video games for the last hour of my of my night from you know 10 to 11 or something like that and then go to bed 11 do it all over go, again do it all over again yeah. right there's no room for that guy to do what i did this past year yeah so now when i started reading these books about hey this is how you maximize your mornings i was waking up at four o'clock in the morning now then i would read right learn what i needed to learn about how to give myself better advantages over the other people in the world that are hustling and grinding and everything like that and then i would do my exercising at that point so i didn't do it in the middle of the day when it's busy and everybody else doing my work early uh, I start work at six o'clock. I'm done at two thirty. I'm able to go and call brokers from two thirty to five o'clock. Find some deals, network with people, do things like that, right? And then you know, I, I'm married too. My wife understands that I, I'm, a, I'm a man on fire. I'm a man on a mission. So she she takes care of my other boy, and, um, my first child, and we were doing all this other stuff. She got we got pregnant during that, so it got a little bit harder towards the end, right. but. But but there's a really stark difference between the guy that I am now and the guy that I was two, just two years ago. Even when I was running my Airbnb, I got comfortable. I was like, oh, sh- this thing's pulling in 70 Gs a year. I made it. I don't need to do anything. Right. right. On top but, of your money. Yeah. On, on, top, on top of your money. Right. Yeah. 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 This thing is pulling in more than the average income here in South Florida for the household. Right. right? And I had we, we just had that. So, um, yeah, I would I would do the Airbnb work. And then I was like, oh, hey, you know what? I don't need to do any more. I didn't go do the work to find another Airbnb. It didn't, it didn't even occur to me at the time. Oh, I need to buy another one and duplicate this. I'm right. like, oh, let me go buy a house. So I buy the house and then my Airbnb is paying for itself. It's paying for my house. I'm like, okay, cool. Right? Didn't think about anything else to do. I was just on autopilot every day. Right? I didn't have that growth mindset, that bigger mindset, everything like that. Yeah. Not until I took the, the Rod Cleese uh, boot camp, um, opened up my mindset, Taught me about goal setting, taught me about, uh, you know, the destination as a target, uh, um, forgetting the destination and, and worrying about the journey, understanding that you'll get your goals as long as you become the type of person who can reach those goals. Right. So then I, I ultimately just transformed myself into a networking machine, underwriting machine and a deal finder. That's and, and those are very valuable skill sets to have in the commercial multifamily space. So oh, which Absolutely. Like, and I would challenge anybody, you don't have to do apartment buildings. There's a million ways to make a million dollars, especially nowadays with e-commerce and uh, crypto and all this other stuff that's out there. Whatever it is that you're passionate about, whatever you want to be passionate about, you got you to try these things to figure it out. Yeah. I started off with uh, life insurance sales. I even got my real estate license back in 2012. And I, mm. hated it. I hated sitting in an open house. I'm just sitting here waiting for people to come by and hopefully they like the house and I sell it. Right. I, was like, I couldn't get down with that. And the life yeah. insurance, man, that was that was a hard sell too. But I but I hustled at it 8 a.m. to 1 at 1 p uh, 1 a.m. You know, every day, six days a week, sometimes seven days a week. But I burned myself out and I hated it. And I just I just grew contempt for that because that wasn't where I was passionate about. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully that's a little bit more of an accurate message for for the target audience that we're talking to. No, absolutely, absolutely. And um you know, I just think that that's important. Again, we're here to demystify the process. Um, if there's someone who's thinking about, you know, perhaps just like you were doing 14 months ago, you know, and they stumble on this this particular episode, and and you really you really did a great job of breaking down um, the mindset, especially because uh, I can't I couldn't agree with you enough on that. Uh, even when I did my first residential deal, it was all about the mindset. I did a HELOC, uh, a home equity line of credit, basically taking money out of your home. I know you know, Rizzo, but um, I did a HELOC and I'm sitting at that closing table like, OK, you know, I got I got the house, the house riding on what I'm trying to do now. It's scary. Very scary. Very Until scary. You do it. But I did it. And, um, you know, my first deal, I mean, I didn't make a whole lot of money. I, I think I made like 26000 But um, I just continued to, you know, duplicate that over and over and over and over again. So, um, so no, I definitely understand what you're, what you're saying about that mindset. And yeah. now, uh, we're just going to apply that to, 
um, this multifamily space and 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 really uh, go hard, especially in 2022, new year, new everything as far as I'm concerned. And I know that goes for you uh, with the with the newborn. How, how's how's Avery doing? By the way, I know she had some complications, but she, yep. she's good now. Yeah, man. Um, thanks for asking. She she needed that emergency surgery day one um, to mm. help repair her esophagus and her trachea and all that other stuff. But ever wow. since then, man, she's been she went from zero to 100 right after that surgery. Her recovery went faster than expected. Uh, she's got she was born with a full head of hair. If you guys find me on Facebook, man, I got a lot of images out there uh, on Instagram as well. Uh, Rasul Mudawakil, probably not very easy to spell. I need to change that handle to something more more typable right (laughs) um but uh but yeah she's doing wonderful man and um i I definitely wanted to mention as well uh like you said i forgot about that 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 first deal jitters i'm gonna admit something even though i've done so well in the commercial space i mentioned that duplex that we bought at first right yeah i that would not have been bought if it was up to me it was all my wife Really? I was okay. so scared. And I was like, okay. look, look at this. This is the reason why we shouldn't buy it. This is the reason why we shouldn't buy it. I was looking at everything that could possibly go wrong, man. I was right. chicken little, sky was falling. I was like, no, 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 this isn't a good idea. She just looked at me. She said, do you trust me? I was like, yes, right? And I wanted to say that because a lot of us, you know, especially when you're just trying to take that first step, you know, we have, we suffer from, a, you know, paralysis through analysis we sit there we, we think too much and it's yeah. and it is a lot simpler than we make it out to be you look at what the house is valued on the market you look at what you're buying it for right, right? there should be a spread there and if there's not a spread there if you're buying it just for turnkey cash flow the rents need to be one percent of the purchase price that's mm, it there you go right don't, don't overcomplicate it don't right. oh well there's this crack in the side of the wall and it's not i mean have an engineer look at it. That's what right. the inspections are for. Right. right. Don't you try to put your, you know, fake expertise that you Googled something and this and that. <laughs> you know, people will scare you out of taking that first step because, again, we're very conditioned to just be like sheep, right? The yeah. shepherds out there, hey, here's a commercial. You know, use your money to go buy one of these different liabilities. Oh, look at this liability. It's shining, this and that. And a lot of us who understand about buying assets, stacking up assets over liabilities and the law of compounding are eventually like for me, honestly, all this hustle and grind is going to take me about, I want to say five to 10 years, 10 years, a hundred percent for sure. Be done. Five years is probably likely with the level of work ethic that I've been able to apply and scale in which I'm doing things. But, and I say, those are the timeframes, but I'll be done working. I don't now have you, to work anymore. You just said something key. Um, in 10 years. Now, mm-hmm. first of all, you you you're a young dude, right? So yeah. 10 years, you just you just gonna chalk it all in. Cause see, I I can't I can't do that. You know, I wanna be, I love the art of the deal. So mm-hmm. even if I'm there multi, multi, multi millions, it's like you know what? I, you you know I got a passion for movies. I'm a film director. Yeah. Let me start a studio. Yeah, cool. And that's mean, what I mean. And that's what I, that's what I mean. Whatever you want to do, I want to take cooking classes in Vegas. Right? Oh, okay. There you I, go. I want to go do what I can do. Whatever it is that I want, I can live my life however it is. I'm gonna take my kids wherever they want to go. Take my my wife to any country that she wants to see. I'm gonna fly yeah. to my first class. All of that stuff is going to be taken care of. We can, we will have enough to live the life that we want and enough growing on the side that's going to be able to perpetually um, take care of our finances for the rest of our lives, for the rest there of my kids' go. lives and my kids' kids' lives. Because I'm focusing on a general generational wealth um, yeah. goal, right? Um, people don't understand if you look at, uh, and, and hopefully this is going to be a video, right, where, where this gets explained, but there's like a very wide spectrum as far as money is concerned and finances, especially interest rates. When you've got bad credit and you're hitting like, you know, 30, 40, 50%. For example, somebody who's making $50,000 a year, right? This is just rough numbers. Obviously there's going to be other taxes, healthcare, whatever. You, sure. They take home $50,000. That's what they have available to spend on all the other stuff. 
Yeah. But they have, you know, $200,000 in debt and they're paying 10% on the, on the interest, right? That's 20 grand just to break even on that debt. Right. If that balance goes to $500,000, then every single available disposable dollar that they have has to go to interest and they have no way of being able to get it. If that thing was $1 over, now they're going to be compounding against themselves with no matter what they do. They have no opportunity to get out of that debt yeah. because the amount of interest is going to be $1 more than what they have available to spend. And then from there, that, that will compound and grow against you. And you just get deeper and deeper and deeper until you have to file bankruptcy or something like that. Yeah, it's now, crazy. Th that's where most of us lie, right? Deep in debt, struggling, figuring out how to make ends meet. My mind is working on the other end of the spectrum. How can I have enough money earning 15, 20, 25%, right? Where it doesn't matter how much I spend, right? Because in 10 years, my goal is to have passively about $500,000 coming in annually, no matter what, what I do. If I, wake, if, I, if I wake up and get out of bed or not, $500,000 is the passive goal that I have. And like I said, I might be able to hit that in year five versus year, year 10. But year 10 is my conservative goal. So that's how okay. I am in underwriting, right? Conservatively, if I do X, Y, and Z, I should hit these goals. I should hit these numbers. Right, right. Um, and so, yeah, I think if you have a good understanding of financial literacy and you understand money's role as a tool, right? You might be, if you're listening to this and you're like, well, I, I'm not, I don't have like a six figure government job. I'm, you know, I'm starting from the bottom. I'm, I'm working two jobs and they're both fast food jobs. I would, I would challenge you to say, hey, you know what? Your first goal would be probably to try to save up $1,000 and you get that $1,000, don't sit on it and wait for an emergency. You're already in an emergency. You don't have enough money to live your life, <laughs> right? So that $1,000 needs to go towards some sort of course to buy a skill. You need, to, you need to invest in yourself, buy a skill that's going to allow you to generate more income. I bet you, Dwayne, have you, have you seen any courses out there for a thousand bucks that'll teach you how to, how to flip a house? Yeah, it's it's all out there. It's all out there. You yeah. can you, you can you can even do it for free. You can go to YouTube, Google, right? Say, hey, how, how do I do this? It's, right. it's, it'll take it'll take you longer. But the reason why I say um buy a course is because that takes the guesswork out of it. It yeah. takes, you know, you find somebody who has a successful track record and you don't have to worry about oh am I doing the right thing or not, because that will at least provide you some sort of blueprint to get to your destination of being yeah. able to flip your first house. And like Dwayne said, he didn't make a lot of money on his first deal. And that was $26,000, right? right? I mean, he made that $26,000, take half of it, put it away for taxes, right? And then so you're sitting on $13,000 in disposable income at that point. Now, reinvest in yourself again until you're able to consistently generate $26,000 in multiple times throughout the year, yeah. right? That one thousand dollar investment can easily get you a skill set. Learn how to program. Learn how to code. Make an app. Make a game. Write down all the things that you're good at and the things that you want to do, and figure out how to monetize it. Right? If you know mm -hmm. how to play instruments, if you know how to play guitar, and you talk to me and said, "Hey, you know what? I can teach you how to play guitar for like, you know, fifty bucks an hour." I would pay you to teach me how to play guitar for fifty bucks right, an hour. Right. Right. I've got two guitars in my house, and I have no idea how to play them. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's there's one right there. Look at that. See? It's just boom. Just chilling. I don't know Hanging on the it. wall. <laughs> and I don't know how to play it, right? Mine is but, in the corner of the guest room. <laughs> it, it, it's it's decor for me when I when I leave the room, right? It's an acoustic right. guitar. I paid a couple hundred bucks for that one. And I was like, man, I don't have time to learn all this right now. So I'm trying to read a book, look at YouTube videos. I would pay somebody money to teach me the way. Absolutely. And that's why you, you, you gotta you gotta figure out what it is that you're good at. What's your gift? We all have like God-given natural talents. And it's our, you know, if, you, if you're into reading the Bible at all, there was a story about the talents, right? And the one who did the worst is the one who took their talent and buried it and said, you know, the father came back and said, hey, look, boom, I have it. It's still here. He didn't multiply it. He didn't use it. didn't do anything with right. it. And he was right. folded for it because you got to take those talents and figure out how to multiply it. 10 exit, 100 exit. There you go. That's right. right. So I would, I would say if somebody's starting on the, on the deep end, um, low income, everything like that, figure out how to increase your income. You can even you invest go. in yourself and get an education. I, I don't recommend it, right? Because that's a different type of trap where they, they lock you down with student loans. Mm. And, um, then there's that. 
they, yeah, yeah. Even my doctor friends, man, they're sitting on two, three hundred thousand dollars of student loans at eight percent interest, right? They owe twenty four grand a year just to break even. Now right. they're getting paid two hundred dollars an hour, and they're working like you know to the bones. But you know, my 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 guys, they they love doing that stuff. They love the medicine. They would do the medicine even if it wasn't paying that much if they could do it, right? Yeah. So people align with your passions, and it'll allow you to get through that first hurdle. Because you're going to run into problems. You're going to run into obstacles. Always, nonstop. Making sure that you're working in something that you love or that you like or that you're good at is definitely going to help make that a lot easier to, to transition beyond. Right, right, right. Hey, you know what? You, you, you've touched on it already, but I wanted to uh, go into something real quick with you. Um, I know mindset is key. And then you even mentioned investing in yourself. Yeah. But from a um, a more practical standpoint, you know, what would you recommend someone do if they're looking to get into this space? Um, if somebody is truly interested in getting started with commercial multifamily, um, there's this thing that we talked about in our mastermind about courage muscle, right? When you when you're when you're brand new and fresh. You're not going to have the confidence or the competence, honestly, to go and say, I want to buy that 400 unit building. You wouldn't know who to talk to. You wouldn't even know what to what to do if you even had the opportunity to get it under contract. It's a very difficult team oriented process. There's a lot of different ways that you can you can make your money. Right. You can be the person who's finding the deals. You can be the person who's boots on the ground, who's doing due diligence, walking through. If you're a high net worth individual, you can sign on the debt. You can put up at risk capital up front. Right with a trusted operator to go ahead and make sure that the deal has enough cash to go do the due diligence, you know, go through closing, everything like that. Sure. Be a capital raiser like me. I like to talk to investors and say, Hey, look, this is a great deal. Let's go put our money to it. So um, figure out where you want to be. Where, where do you fit in the whole thing? Like what role do you want to play in the team uh, team sport of uh, commercial multifamily and get educated on how to do that best read books about it. I would say definitely changing your mindset and having a, a, um, a bigger outlook on what the possibilities are in life and in business and start believing that you have the ability, the capability and the potential to do really well in whatever you decide that you want to do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I know everything I say goes all the way back to mindset and people are just like, oh, no, show me one, two, three, X, Y, Z. I'm telling you. All that stuff is irrelevant if you don't even believe it deep down yeah. in your heart that you can do it. That mindset is everything, Rizul. It really is. I agree. Um, one other thing I wanted to make mention of, since I do have the, uh, you know, you you are one of the, the, the better underwriters out there. Um, if someone does want to get into this space, how do they go about analyzing the deal? There are a couple of key components or metrics that you're always going to have to look at yep. in order to determine what a good deal is. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, so what you're going to want to do is use an underwriting analyzer, right? So you, there's, there's a property, like these spreadsheets, that taking the information, especially if you're working with like three, 400 unit buildings, there's a lot of different unit types, square footages, different rents for each one, you know, um, and you have to be able to take all that information. You got to take your debt instrument, you know. Well, Which one do you use by chance? I like Michael Blank. Who do you use when you- Michael Blank is who I use as well. Okay. Right? Michael okay. Blank, it's, it's relatively inexpensive. He has right. a tutorial on YouTube. You can look it up, figure out how to use it, start to yeah. finish. Um, David Tupin has another one. He has a yes. free one and he has a paid one that goes a bit more in depth. Uh, Rob Beardsley, uh, Lone Star Capital out of mm -hmm. Texas. He has one um, that's free. It's pretty robust as well. Um, I liked it for a little while, but mm -hmm. ultimately um, I was introduced to, to Michael Blanc. And it's very technical and I've yeah. tweaked it and I've, I've you know, made it my own. And it has a lot, a lot to offer. There's a lot of levers that I can pull to figure out how many different ways I can make a deal work. So Michael Blanc's syndicated deal analyzer is a really, really good one. And it does, okay. it does, it takes care of most of my needs for what I have to do at that. Yeah. I didn't mean to disturb your flow, but I just uh -huh. wanted to ask that question of you, you know, cause that's important as well. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, but that's, um, that's, is that pretty much is that pretty much it? You would say that the deal analyzer is key. Yeah, um, you have to. I mean, honestly, if you're number savvy and you're tech savvy enough with Excel, make your own. Right. Because mm -hmm. no one's going to understand what you're looking for in your deal the way that you are. Right. right. You want to know all these different things. And then as you start building these things out and seeing how they all play and react with one another and everything like yeah. that. Um, I've taken apart the Michael Blank uh, underwrite. I look at all the formulas. I look at the relationship back and forth and like that. I'm personally of the belief that, you know, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel if it's already there? So I just use what was existing and then I just change a couple of things to better suit my needs. Right. Okay. And it was pretty close for, for what I needed. Um, and there's still some improvements that can be made. I talk about it with my team. I'm with Disrupt Equity right now based out of Houston, Texas. Mm. Um, shout out to Ben and Ferris. Um, they, they have basically taken me on board and I'm helping them grow their empire. And they, you know, our goals are very much in line. The way that we look at deals is very similar, fairly conservative. We push where we need to push to try to win a deal, but we don't push too far and just try to win the deal for the sake of winning a deal. Because right. at that point, we're, we're, we're not, we're being too careless with investor money at that point. So uh, is this someone you've partnered with? Because congratulations on that, by the yeah. way. I, I remember when that initially happened for you, but I didn't exactly know what it was. I didn't know if you had, you know, signed on with a company or did you mm -hmm. partner with some guys? How, how does that work exactly? And it, it seems to have added to your to your overall goals. So oh, I yeah, guess absolutely. it's a win win. It's a win-win all around for sure. Uh, you can check us out, www.disruptequity.com. Um, check out the About section. You'll see my uh, my handsome face over there. Um, they talk about all the team members, what our skill sets are. I am the director of acquisitions um, for them. So now when I'm done with my W-2 stuff, I focus more primarily now on the acquisition side. So I'm developing more broker relations, trying to find deals. And I'm networking with a lot of other people who do have deals and having them just bring in the deal flow. Um, I still underwrite, right? I still uh, do those other things. And um, a lot of times, some of the deals that Disrupt does are too uh, are, are too big for a lot of the other guys that I've networked with and things like that. So when these guys bring me deals, you know, I'm still doing my own thing, um, raising capital for those smaller deals. I was just looking at a 70 unit. Somebody brought me another 40 unit, even a seven unit that I was going to uh, take down with one other guy. We we're going to partner on that one. And just throw it in, throw in the mix because we want to hold yeah. these things for the long term. The bigger deals typically are kind of like long term flips where we're taking, you know, twenty five million dollars of investor money and turning it into fifty million dollars, right? There so, you go. Um, but I'm not providing the twenty five million dollars yet. I'm still, I still need the things that are going to be personally paying out and holding on for that long term cash flow, so I can okay. hit all my um, personal metrics as well. Uh, but yeah, Disrupt Equity, man, they're doing some really huge things based out of Houston, a lot of holdings in Texas, Georgia, Atlanta, your backyard, so a yeah. lot of um, deals that they do out there. And we're looking to expand into Florida, um, the Carolinas, still stay in Georgia, Tennessee, Midwest, um, Ohio, places like is, that. And yeah, so really busy, really, this really looking and working. Okay, my bad. I thought you had stopped. Uh, is this primarily uh, Class A or what, what are y'all doing? Yep, we're doing class A, class B um, deals, uh, maybe a class C deal. It just depends because um, one of the things that if you're learning about commercial multifamily, you're getting into this, you'll notice right now is a really, really hot market, right? The, the Fed printed 40% of the total amount of money that we've ever printed in life back in 2020. Right. And, and in the past so year. Money in the market right now. Yeah, right. in the past year. And, and so now all that money is looking for a home. So a lot of these institutional buyers, um, you know, these Wall Street guys, they only need to hit like five, six, 7% return on their money. Whereas for us as a private equity firm, we're trying to get our investors, you know, 15, 20, 25% of their money, mm. right? So um, right now, because of all that, with money supply going up, the values are increasing, right? Interest rates are going down and cap rates are compressing. So the reason why traditionally we would go for B and C value add deals because you can you know, have a lot of meat on the bone and, 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 and get that. Right now, the cap rates are so compressed that the value that you're getting out of a C uh, class deal 
is only marginally better than what you get out of an A or a B. And then so right. the reasoning is why go through all the headache of de dealing with C class tenants, yeah, C class just, prime, C class. Just go building. for the top. Yeah, we'll just go for a nice class A assets, beautiful. The tenant base is awesome. They all pay on time. You don't have to worry about those hassles. Right. And it'll cost you half a point on returns. You know, it's it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah. Like, do you want to? Do you really want to struggle and 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 give yourself that headache and deal with all of these other difficult uh, problems in real estate? The business is hard enough as it is, but do you want to add to it for an extra half a point? Now, see, that's a whole new philosophy for you. I hadn't heard yeah. you say that. When you, we, you know, looking at B and C yeah. value added, you yeah. know, situations, so that we could. You know, go that route, but say you you sort of change your perspective a little bit. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm still personally open to some C class deals that they're smaller, but not on a large scale, right? Because when you go yeah. scale, everything grows, and I don't want you know you know you know to deal with like thirty evictions and stuff like that on a C class yeah. property. I'll deal with a handful of them right, yeah. if I have to to go ahead and clean up that property and make sure that you know people are treating the assets right. I um, got you. But I, I just today in the meeting before this call, I was looking at a deal that was being underwritten. It was a C class out of Dallas, 70 units going in cap rates, four and a half percent. Four and a half percent on a C class property. Right. Whereas back in the day, man, that's like an, that's like a double A plus property cap rate. Right. 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 If I'm going to deal with the C class, I want it. I want it at a 10 cap. Okay. Right. Maybe I'll stretch to like an eight cap. And yeah. just so for, for everybody listening, a capitalization rate is basically how much money oh. you're making, uh, how much you're getting back on the money that you're putting out there, right? So if you're putting a million dollars into something, you're getting, um, you're making eight percent, or call it ten percent, you're making a hundred thousand dollars, right? In your in your net operating income, right? right. That's a tech cap. If you're if you're, and that's what we mean, right? So a C class, higher risk, higher reward. In A class, lower risk, lower reward. So the, the 4% cap rate on a million dollar property is only $40,000. I'll take $40,000 on an A class property that I don't have to worry about yeah. versus $50,000 and I have to go and stress my, an extra five grand a year per million dollars. Yeah. It's not, it's not worth the headache. Yeah, right? I get you. I get so, you. So those are, those are some of the considerations that you have to, and, and again, if you, if you talk these things out, if you understand the numbers, it just it just makes sense. The numbers right. will speak for you from an underwriting perspective. The the deal will tell me if I should buy it or not. Yeah. Right? Too many people are trying to be like, oh, if you squint, you turn your head sideways and you'll step back just a little bit. <laughs> now that deal's all right. Let's go buy it. Right. <laughs> and I'm like, nah, man, I got 2020 vision. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm good. That. I'll look for the I next one. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Well, listen, um, in conclusion, you know, since since you, you, you're doing all these extravagant numbers, um, I guess you I guess you've surpassed 10 million at this point. Right. Uh, yeah. I, I like I said, I think the total um, assets under management is about 120, 120 million. Blows my mind. <laughs> my la the last deal that we closed on was a responsible for a majority of that. It was a $70.4 million purchase that we did in last week of, of December. I was getting ready to say, man, listen, three months ago, you were saying 10 minutes, something along those lines, and now yeah. it's it's 100. Yeah. That's beautiful. Like I man. said, 10 extra goals, man. There you go. Hey, so with I, I'm going to just, you know, get a little ignorant now with it, but. With all of this that's coming in, have you? Uh, what, what's your most extravagant purchase? What, what have you done thus far? My most extravagant purchase is all the money that I'm making. Did you not listen to me? <laughs> I am reinvesting every dollar that I'm making. We sold my sports car, right? So at least like, you had one. So it's I not had, as though well, you're above it, Razul. I, 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 had, I had one okay. from 20, 2015 when my wife and I, we, we went over our budget and we looked and we're like, hey, you know, after all our expenses, our retirement, our 401k, our IRAs, we still have like $1,000 a month left over in discretionary fund. This is yes. outside of our personal budgets for personal spending. We give our, right. we had ourselves a, an allowance of $300 a month to go. Okay. I can buy whatever I want. She can buy whatever she wants. And we can't complain about it. But if it's over $150, we talk about it. We just let, it's like a courtesy. We let them know, hey, by the way, I want to spend $150 on XYZ. That's, That's how good. we do our finances, right? And so we, 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 we sat down, we did our budget, we had an extra thousand dollars. And we're like, 
should we splurge on a nice sports car? Uh, and she was like, oh, I don't know. I was like, well, yeah, I'm, I, I like cars, right? I get my yeah. screensaver on my computer is a Lamborghini. That's going to be the goal when I, when okay. I get there, right? Okay. But, uh, but yeah, during COVID, we're both working from home. It's a two-door sports car and an Audi TTS. And it was just sitting there. I was like, that is $24,000 of equity that we can go and put somewhere else. So we got rid of it, right? I tried to put my, my son in the car seat back there. and Tight. And, and, His and legs hurt. Yeah. Because, and that's the thing, right? I'm doing all these deals. And like, I, I, I'm glad that you asked me that question because I have never been more broke than I am right now, right? I have no money because all of my money is out working to get me other money. I'm an investor now. Yeah. Right. I don't have that employee mindset. Oh, you know what? Boom. I just had this big windfall. Boom. Big acquisition fee from this deal. Boom. I right. get all these distributions from my other deals and it's building up in my bank account. I could go buy something. If I wanted to go buy a Lambo right now, I could. Yeah. But it'll just set me back. Right. I look at I have a 10 year goal. If I go buy a Lambo right now, it'll set me back another five years. Right. And I so, get it. I get so, it. So may, maybe I could, but if I if I focus and I keep my head down and I just do what I need, what I know to get uh, needs to get done, I'm sacrificing now for a better tomorrow, right? And I know a lot of people will look at it and like, oh, you never know when you're gonna die. Life is short, and this, <laughs> All that, that. blah blah blah. And right. I'm like, maybe, but for most of us, the average is like 80 years. That's right? it. People, people don't think about it as like we only have 28,000 days. If we're lucky, that's what we're blessed with. Twenty-eight thousand days. Let, listen to the underwriter. How, right? how many days we got, Razul? How many? We got twenty-eight. We got twenty-eight thousand days that we're allotted to go ahead and live our life, start to finish. You know, do what you want to do, get what you need to get done. Right? I've already spent like thirteen thousand of my days. Right? Wow. I'm getting. Yeah. I'm getting close to to halfway. Yeah. Right. Twenty-eight thousand days comes up to eighty years. And so if you think about it from that perspective, man, every day that passes, the, the ones that are left get a lot more valuable. Yeah. So I could go ahead and party it up and do it like I did. And I've, I've kind of already done that. I, um, when I got out of the military, right, I didn't do anything. I just played video games. World of Warcraft when it came out back in 2004. Okay. Okay. And I just sat in my room on my computer, just playing. I didn't go out. I traveled the world, never stepped foot outside because I was an introvert. I was real quiet, shy. I didn't talk to anybody. Oh, I was wow. Nerding out online. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, I, that's something. I was real quiet. And um, so all that I, money was saved all up. All that money was saved up. Bro, I, I was making $20,000 a year. When I, when I left the military, I had 40 G's in the bank. <laughs> right? I had 40 G's in the bank. You know what I did? Because I didn't know any better. What? Seven hundred dollar bottle of Grey Goose. Partying six days a week in Miami, doing all the things that I was like, oh, you know what? I deserve it. I can do this. I met up with my friends who weren't doing much with their lives, and right. you know, I got caught up. That's the guy that I was. Those are the actions, the habits. I would wake up at four p.m. Right? Four. And four p.m. 4 p.m. I w we would go hang out, have fun, because I was I was jaded. I hated the military. I was bitter. I joined right after 9/11, and um, you know I'm glad that I, I went into service, but I had I didn't have a good time. Um, and thank you for your service, by the way, man. Anytime, my friend. Well, just the one time. I'm not doing that again. Yeah, I um, get it. I get it. But uh, so I got out, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go live my life. I'm gonna go do all the things that I never got to do when I was in, and this and that, and blah blah blah. And I ended up blowing all of that cash, partying mm. six days a week in Miami, going to different clubs, partying with my friends. You know, we would get ready at 11, go out at 1 a.m., come home at 6. That's why I was waking up at 4. Every right. day except for Tuesday because there was no party on Tuesday that we wanted to go to. Right. Just lounging, lounging at the pool, you know, pissing my life away. Just like, ah, man, I, I felt like I made it. I was in retirement. Right. Yeah. Until the money ran out. And then it was like, oh, shoot, what do I do now? Yeah. And then and then that's when the girl I was dating said, you know, you play so much video games, you should make it your job. I was like, that is genius. <laughs> so I, got, I got a degree. That's when you went to school for, for video game programming. That's exactly what, how it happened. Yeah. 
And wow. then by the time I graduated, it was the Great Recession. I couldn't even get a job as a programmer. Everybody's getting laid off. So yeah. I was like, all right, well, I need to pay these student loans. So I, I became a life insurance salesman. And that's how I learned how to be more outgoing, how to be more uh, approachable. Sales oriented and, even, I would imagine. Yeah. That's exactly sales yeah. is everything with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sales was probably the best skill I ever learned in my life. It's it's what you know, combining the sale, the skill of sales, my underwriting ability, talking to investors, all the it's just like a perfect marriage of a lot of the skill sets that I picked up over the years. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it, and we're probably going off on all kinds of different tangents, but yeah, to answer your question, what big expense have I made? Uh I've I've invested into a 42 unit apartment building. That's pretty big. That was a two million dollar purchase. Uh, I invested into a, a hotel deal in Madison, Wisconsin. That was a pretty big purchase. That one was okay. Uh, you know, okay. 15 million. Um, I invested into 48 units in Illyria. That was a 2.2 million dollar purchase. Another small 25 thousand dollar investment into um, that 18 unit. That was a six hundred thousand dollar purchase. When we closed, it appraised at seven hundred thousand. So I already made twenty five percent of my money right off the bat. Wow. Um, I mean, and yeah. at this point, yeah. also you're you're sort of using other people's money because you've aligned yourself with all of these whales. It yeah. sounds like exactly. And so every time I make money, I'm I'm putting I'm, I'm every time I hit fifty fifty thousand in my bank account, I'm putting into a deal. So you are still spending some of your own money as well? My my own personal money is is supporting my lifestyle right now. Um, the same as it was from before I got into business. So okay. we have we still have our budget and we actually cut down on our um we cut down on our personal expenses, right? So we're getting pay raises, we're getting promotions at work. And right. now we're cutting back on what our personal expenses are because we don't want to spend more. We want more money going to fuel the business. Right. Yeah. So that's that's how I look at money now. I'm like, no, I don't I don't want to go buy a nice sports car yet. But when yeah, my passive income you. is at that level. Right. I will I will spend 10 percent of our annual income on uh, on a vehicle. So if I want that two hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini, I need to be bringing in about two million dollars. Yeah. Right. That's that's how I look at it. But until that's then, great. That's I great. I don't I don't I don't want to. I don't have that desire to go. Oh, I need to go travel first class right now. We still we still splurge a little bit. But splurging is like a nice dinner. Right? There you go. Like a two hundred dollar steak dinner someplace. Two hundred. Oh, you must be you must be in, in uh, and delving in some some Wagyu. You wagyu, talking about two hundred. Yeah, Yes, okay. Sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You okay. know that A five Japanese Miyazaki. That, that A five. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah, man. So, so, so from that perspective, that's how I splurge on it. Because again, my mindset is not like, oh, how can I have this money? You know, it's burning a hole in my pocket. How can I get rid of it? My mindset is, every time I look at money now, it's worth ten times more than what its current value is to me because I'm looking at it in the future. My wife wanted to go get a pool for our backyard. We got quoted for it. It was seventy thousand dollars. I was like, "Babe, this pool is going to cost us seven hundred grand." She was like, "No, it's not. What are you talking about?" And I was like, "Look, if we take that seventy grand and we put it into this deal ten years from now, it's seven hundred grand." Right? <laughs> that, that's how I look at things right now. So I know yeah. she's getting tired of you and all your underwriting, man. But that's beautiful. And to your point, man, um, as far as that's concerned, we're of the same mindset. I'm, uh, you know, my family's been known to call me McFrugal. You know, we just laugh about it, whatever. But um, I love nice things. Don't get me wrong. But uh, for me, it's it's all about the investment. It's all about the investment. So I understand and wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying. And uh, I think that's uh, the best mindset to have, Razul. So Congratulations, man, on all your success. Uh, I know you've got more coming. Um, I might even have to talk with you offline, man, because these numbers you dropping are just ridiculous. So yeah, man. Uh, come on yeah. in. The water's fine, dude. The water, the water's fine. There you yes, go. Sir. There you go. Well, man, listen, um, did you have anything um that you wanted to add that maybe we haven't discussed? I would say to anybody listening, if you're 
afraid of taking that first step or you're just confused or you don't know, right? If you want some help breaking down your finances. For the time being, because I haven't put into place everything that I want um, infrastructure wise with my financial literacy, literacy courses and just materials to be able to help provide that blueprint on, hey, this is how you go from, you know, where I was making 550 an hour at KFC to now, you know, doing, you know, multi-million dollar apartment deals, I can show you the path that I took to get there and maybe it'll be of some use to you. But until I put that in place and start charging for it right now, hit me up, find me on Facebook, find me on Instagram, find me through Dwayne and say, hey, um, I, I want to I be able to talk to Rasul and ask him some questions. I'm more than willing to help meet people and, and help them. You know, I just want to be of value. I want to be of service. Because I understand the more people that I help get what they want, the faster it is that for me to get what it is that I want. Hey, man, that's well said. I couldn't say it any better. Um, congratulations again on everything, man. I sincerely mean that. You're obviously a guy with a good heart. You just put that out on for the world to see and said, just contact me. So. Yeah. Yeah, you, you definitely the real deal, man. And um, it was a pleasure interviewing you today. And I'll definitely be uh, following up with you as well, Razul. Sure, man, I'll be looking forward to the link so I can spread it out and get your uh, shows a little bit more, uh, some more viewership. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you so much again. And uh, kiss some kids for me, uh, you know, and you guys take care of yourselves. All right. All right. Thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. All right, man. Thanks again.